I'm Mally. <laughs> I'm a writer at NIR, and I've been lucky to know Alex and Ilya for a few years now. I hope you don't need to be introduced to them after two days at Redacted, but they're the co-founders of NIR Protocol and NIR AI. And since we're here at the end of our two days, I thought it would be fun to zoom out and talk about the goals for user-owned AI, for AGI, um, and kind of what the point of all of this work is pursuing um, conscious machines. So I'm just going to ask them some interesting questions and let them ask each other interesting questions, and we'll see where we go. Um, so to kick off, does one of you want to try to define AGI? OK, so I have my own definition. I define AGI as a machine that is better than I at everything I can do. OK, uh, that's is, a high standard, I, higher I, than most. I, well, I, I, I would say my definition is everything that any best person at that skill Yeah, can that's, do. that's open AI's definition and, as well, yeah. And Alex just assumes he's the best at everything, so. <laughs> <laughs> he might be. So yeah, AI that matches or surpasses human cognitive abilities. So if we are pursuing AGI, then I would argue we're also pursuing conscious AI. So that is the premise of this fireside chat. I'll also give a disclaimer that Alex asked me to give, which is <laughs> none of us claims to be an expert on consciousness, but I would posit that these two are experts on AI. So we'll land somewhere in the middle of <laughs> AI and consciousness, I guess. Um, so people love the origin story of Nier, and um, I, I guess I'm just curious for you to retell the story of why you named Nier AI what you did. Yeah. So. So I kind of liked, I liked Singularity since the moment when I had to spend uh, 16 hours with a friend of mine on the way from Izhask to Moscow in a train, and he just read, it was 2005, so the Singularity is near, just came out, he read it, and so I was tortured for 16 hours where he was telling me how <laughs> the all-encompassing uh, artificial intelligence, as, as he would call it, will, um, is everything we need. Uh, and he was very convincing. So at the end of the trip, I was, <laughs> I was thinking a lot about it. Uh, and this concept, then, then in 2012, I finally decided to read the book seven years later, and I liked it a lot. And then, uh, like, my license plate has been near uh, since way longer than near existed. And the, the near.ai domain I also bought way before I even contemplated the idea of starting a company, right? And so, yeah, and then when Ilya and I started the company, the I don't know, I had the domain. I was like, hey, what do you think of Nier? He's like, yeah, Nier sounds like a cool name. You know, rolls the tongue, so let, let's go with it. <laughs> so it wasn't about pursuing the singularity, you just liked the name. Well, it, it, yeah, it, it was. was. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I mean, the, the plan was, I mean, which is still the plan, AI developer, AI researcher, AGI. Yeah. And uh, yeah, effectively, uh, at the time, we were thinking we're going to be the first trillion dollar company. Uh, that was the plan in 17. No recollection. <laughs> now there's a few other companies, so maybe, you know, aiming 10. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the idea that effectively, like, through software engineering, we're able to actually advance AI, that was kind of the premise for Near AI. It was uh, conceived in the train out of Toulon to Paris uh, after we got... Um, yeah. Very jet-lagged. <laughs> very jet-lagged, very... Uh, Toulon also is an interesting place. Uh, <laughs> And so we were, we were coming from the ICLR conference where there was a lot of program synthesis papers, and we we're like, this is happening. It's, it's clearly here, and so we need to, we need to capitalize on this and actually uh, uh, kind of front run it by getting way better data and get a way better, uh, effectively, uh, AI developer. So here we are, <laughs> six years later, but uh, the mission is still Full there. Circle. That was 2017, seven years later. It's now seven years, wow. <laughs> yeah, Ilya, you've, you obviously were an AI researcher before starting NIR, and I know you developed an interest in an early age. Um, what made you first get interested in AI and, and in studying it? Well, yeah, I mentioned this quite a few times, but uh, the movie Artificial Intelligence that I think came out in 2000 or 2001, so I was like 10 years old, I think we had a class trip to watch it. Um, but uh, yeah, somehow it left an impression on me. And then I was reading a lot of science fiction. Um, and so that always kind of um, 
it seemed to me clear that we need to have an AI that will be our companion, that will be our partner, that will be uh, effectively removing all the mundane tasks. Uh, I may have thought also it will you know, go trade on market, make a lot of money, and then uh, help to improve the life everywhere. Um, but to me, it's always, yeah. I was imagining it would have some form of consciousness um, and at the same time kind of omnipresence to be able to execute any actions anywhere. And so uh, now as I was, you know, growing up teenager trying to do stuff <laughs> with machine learning back then, <laughs> the, the reality was not there. But uh, yeah, um, continued working on this kind of across working in the uh, machine learning field, and then joining Google, focusing more on text, knowledge, understanding, and uh, pushing the envelope, transformers, and then near AI. Alex, what about you? When did you decide to start working on AI? You were doing something else before. Yeah, so uh, around 2014, I want to say, I was, uh, I was playing an online game, uh, and there was a particular mechanic that required solving a simple captcha. Uh, and it was uh, it, it was automatable even without AI because uh, th there are websites where people can solve captures for you, but they really didn't like paying for it. Uh, and so yeah, I then loaded there was a framework back in the day called Lasagna. You know, you have layers in a transformer, so it's a Lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and I remember I, I I really did not expect it to work because I think in 2014 it was not quite clear. Like 2012 was when deep learning started, and I think two years later, majority of people, I definitely, uh, didn't quite catch up yet to what was possible. And I remember I trained this neural network, and I ran it, and it had like 99% accuracy, and I was like, holy cow, you know, like, how, how could it possibly be? Because, you know, like, like I think, as an engineer, before machine learning, you, th you sort of think of machines as rigid, right, and the captcha, it's like, a, it's not rigid. Yeah, and so, and so from there, I was doing a lot of AI, and I was working for this company called Single Store, uh, and I was like, okay, guys, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> <But it's>, uh, <laughs> and they were, they were trying to, you know, uh, we have the saying in Russian, which is like to stretch an owl on the globe. Uh, <laughs> so, so they tried to introduce AI into, into the work of single store, but <laughs> they, they failed. So, so yeah, I left and I started, uh, you know, w what would become near eventually. Um, so Ilya, you said your motivation is basically augmenting human intelligence and making, making us more efficient. Is that fair? Do you still consider that your motivator for working on this? Yeah, I think, I mean, there is a kind of multiple dimensions, obviously, to where AI can lead. But I think the most obvious one, which already has been happening for over a decade, right, has or 20 years now, has been augmenting our intelligence, right? Google being the first effectively machine learning system that became globally available for everyone to augment intelligence to find any information you want. And so, I mean, the current reincarnation of that is extension of that. And as these machines are becoming intel more intelligent themselves, they, you know, able to execute more complex actions, uh, make decisions. Now, the where we go from here is indeed a branch of either kind of effectively merging a human and machine, that's one direction, or creating a new um, beings that are kind of coexisting with us. And I think probably given how world's structured, pro all of these directions will be explored. And so, um, but at the same time, I think the our, our kind of humanity is driven by selfishness, and so augmenting ourselves is a way likelier and more resource allocated path than creating another species, which, you know, generally humanity is very good at destroying species, not creating. But at the same time, given we have kind of, you know, we create a digital environment for digital species to, to exist, there is also an interesting opportunity for that. We created Corgis. That's why you're here, <laughs> Corgis. Um, yeah, Alex, you've said that your motivation is perhaps more defensive. So what motivates you to pursue building AGI or super intelligent AI? Uh, I don't know if it's more defensive, but generally, I, th ah, I see what you, see. you mean. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Sorry, leading yeah, question. Yeah. You can tell yeah, your no, version. No. It takes me time to catch up. <laughs> yeah, so, so generally, 
I, I really don't like the span of life that is uh, uh, allocated by default. I think it's pretty short. Uh, and with every passing day, it feels shorter. Uh, and, and I think AI is the, uh, is the more, when I was, um, like when I was in the train with that person, I think one of the things that uh, particularly uh, was inspiring for me that, that he, the way he was looking at it is the path to immortality, right? Because if we can tra transfer our brains into a machine, you can live for as long as you can maintain the machine, right? And so, you know, if, if, so, if, one, if someone wants to live much longer than, uh, you know, the pre-allocated 100 years, that's a, a more reliable path. And even, you know, so longevity would be the, the second path, but longevity gives you longer time span, but not redundancy. While if you move yourself to a machine, not only you can live much longer, you also have redundancy. So if something happens, you can, uh, you can move yourself. Restore from backup? Restore from a backup, yeah, or, or like make a couple of copies. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so, it's, uh, so that's what's been driving me for quite a while, and still drives me. So yeah, ideally, so yeah, Ilya wants to augment a human, I want to, uh, yeah, I, I want to fully move into the, into the virtual. You're ready to be a machine. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that is effectively like as, as, as we integrating closer and closer, yeah. the, the final step of that integration, your full, like if that is indeed a, the most conspiracy. Are we good? Um, yeah, as, as we become more integrated, right, uh, our intelligence may move into the digital realm uh, if that's a more uh, effective path to do that. Or we'll have a more uh, conscious beings that exist independently, and then uh, we'll be figuring out how to negotiate with them. Alex, you've also said before that you are also motivated by uh, beating someone potentially bad to building EGI. Uh, can you talk a bit about that? <laughs> <clears throat> right about what? Like the idea that that someone, if someone else builds it first, they might have the wrong motivation. So it's yeah, yeah, that's, it's that's for your sure. obligation so, so, to build it. So I think generally, and, and I think it's very interesting from perspective of uh, current alignment efforts. If you talk to people from Anthropic, from uh, there are some other entities that pursue alignment. Many of them look at alignment from perspective of how do we make models that we build, that, like, right, so Anthropic has Claude, right, and so they, they say, how do we make Claude to be safe, uh, which is not quite uh, the risk. I, I don't think the risk from perspective of Anthropic should be, hey, the Claude, that Claude will escape and do something harmful. The actual threat we have is that some malicious actors, right, and some, um, you know, there are some, some countries which we believe might be implicated in the future in doing that, that some malicious actors train uh, a malicious AI and, and use it for, for, for malicious purposes. And naturally, none of what Anthropic is doing in any way is preventing that. And uh, uh, mostly, I think, if, if people actually build AGI and use it for bad, not much we can do. It's an entity that is smarter than us. So no matter what we do, uh, it's a game that we will lose. But we can, we can defend against certain things that people can do before AGI is reached. Right? So a good example I like to give is that I'm pretty sure we are very close to the moment where AI will be much better than us at reading and analyzing code. And because most of the, like, you know, Linux operating system is millions of lines of code, of course it has bugs. But security model is, is effectively such that a very smart human, by looking at that code, will not find them, because many, many smart humans looked at it and didn't find it. Mm -hmm. But something smarter than human could, right? And so if someone has access earlier than others to, to utility that allows you to do that, right, they could be a good guy who will just open uh, the bug reports and patch all of those, or they could be a bad guy who will bring down the whole internet, uh, right? And that will be a massive, uh, you know, bad event. Mm -hmm. But we can prepare to that, right? Like we can, for example, invest heavily into formal verification and rewrite majority of the core infrastructure in a way that is formally verified, so that you know that no matter how smart your opponent is, uh, they would not be able to break it, right? So, so like th that would be a more, I think, reasonable approach to safety, where you try to predict. Uh, the particular, you know, attack, attack vectors mm -hmm. and, and start patching them ahead of time. AI for safety on the way to conscious AI. Yeah. How will we know when we have achieved conscious AI or that AGI is conscious? Well, I think we, 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 we kind know? of bypassed the definition of consciousness in general. Oh, yeah, I guess <laughs> I didn't come back to asking that. Okay, what's consciousness? Yeah, I think that's, that's a question everybody 
is uh, struggling with, and I think that's why that's why things have been very hard to define. Um, and kind of AI space is yeah, like there's every everything from people who already thought that who thought of LMs even like two three years ago already conscious, right? Uh, and kind of uh, hey, we you know effectively killing a conscious being by like stopping the program. Mm -hmm. uh, to people who are like hey, this is just a you know, token parrot and just predicts the next token and it's just statistics. Uh, and so I think the same question is like, you know, is dogs conscious? Um, like kind of unclear, but the, I think the best definition I've um, kind of saw has been effectively understanding of a presence of self. So this is when whatever the system is, it's able to understand that it is exists within some world and it can execute actions and it can effectively uh, like reflect on its own presence in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how to quantify that and <laughs> like what's a benchmark for that yeah. is a little bit hard because the problem is if you assume um, like if you test for that and it's like a token parrot, it will effectively tell you everything that you think will make them conscious. That's it why knows what conscious people sound like. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think the, the the experiment you were mentioning that if you remove everything about consciousness from the training data and then yeah. train on it, yeah, it's from from Ilya. Yeah. From from the other Ilya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you remove all the consciousness data and then you ask effectively, are you conscious? If it's able to infer that. But I think all of this is yeah pretty limited, um, and given like we don't have introspection even in how our head works, it's uh, yeah it's pretty challenging. But uh, yeah, so that that is a very interesting question where where that boundary lies. Yeah, our consciousness doesn't emerge in isolation either. So uh, an AI that doesn't know the words for consciousness or feelings isn't isn't necessarily emerging the same way ours does. But at the same time, we can think like, well, when you and this is to, to the question is like, is predicting next token everything you need? Like you can, you know, hypothesize that this is effectively what we're doing. We're just predicting the next sensory input. And the most effective way to do that is understanding kind of our presence in the world and being to reflect on that. And effectively, consciousness emerges as a way to the most effectively compress information and predict next token and predict, you know, not just short term, but also long term and effectively optimize all the chemicals that are driving our uh, kind of body. And so the, the question there is like, what is the effective alternative of that in the digital system? And I mean, people have been trying a lot of embodiment and kind of, you know, video games, et cetera, as a way to kind of create the environment where there is uh, such thing. And that goes into like, well, let's say we create a simulation, right? We have a lot of AIs running around and kind of um, figuring out themselves. And uh, yeah, like, you know, if you control C that simulation, <laughs> like how do we know where, where we are on the, uh, on the spectrum of, uh, I stopped the program to I killed a bunch of conscious beings. But if the person ceases to exist, is he killed? If he, yeah, if he, so the, if he just ceases to exist in the moment. Yeah. Right. It's so, the, so we, we were discussing this because the 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 experiment is like if you you know restart the world effectively from a snapshot and do two things, like do some you know h harm to a person twice, is this. Like, did that person experience this twice or yep. once or uh, zero time? As well as if you, if that person never existed, have that, like, <laughs> did that harm was done or not, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, or, or, or like, here's another thought experiment. Imagine that, imagine that it turns out that uh, people never figured out how to do anesthetics. Instead, they figured out how to do a drug which erases the last hour of memories. So you always experience what happens, but you just never remember. Is it actually is it actually a good painkiller or not? <laughs> mm. What about you, Alex? Do you think we'll know when we when AGI has been achieved? I, I think um, I, I don't have a, a very good uh, sort of opinion here, but I suspect that we will we will see it <laughs> from from like uh, 
from uh, second order effects. second order effects. Yeah, just by interacting with it, at some point you will be like, well, I have no doubt that I'm interacting with a conscious being. There are some people who already feel that way about AI systems they're interacting with. So yeah. maybe we're already there and we don't know. Well, I mean, effectively that was a Turing test, right? Like, yeah. can if you talk sufficient amount of time with this, can you guess if it's a person or not? Mm -hmm. That that was in a way a uh, and I think like, you know, there's still whole, like there's definitely Turing test when you don't ask it hard questions is effectively passed. Yeah. So now it's all about like, when you interact with it, can it, uh, can it effectively, like w w the way we test that this is LLM right now is like, can it solve hard problems and harder problems and <laughs> problems that even people cannot solve anymore uh, or some people cannot solve anymore. And so I think the reality is like we're approaching that it's just it's still a program right so like it it totally like i actually think it's totally possible we'll have a a, system, a machine system that is smarter than any of us individually has more advanced skills can act in this digital world right <laughs> given what we're building yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and do anything and is not conscious because it's still effectively just a machine that you know acts on the input. Now, if you put that machine into a world, effectively give it some feedback loop and give it some value function that it, it is trying to optimize, that's when we can start actually assume that some form of consciousness may arrive. And this is where like an autonomous agent is actually an interesting thought experiment because uh, you, you're giving them a mission, right? This can be anything from, you know, make more money on exchange or, uh, you know, let's save the planet and not let it, um, not, not let humanity destroy itself. And, uh, you know, give it some resources like money, you know, crypto assets, and then you loop it effectively to, you know, keep thinking about what is possible and how should it do it. And you let it act by deploying capital and, if the question there is like, yeah, at what stage we can consider this a consciousness, conscious uh, versus just uh, carrying out. Some yeah, versus carrying commands. out. And, and, yeah. 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 I mean, if that's if if AGI is just like a super powerful calculator, then why do you think people are so afraid of it? So or are we actually just go ahead? Well, on. well, to that question, I think people are afraid of people. And so people project the people's fear to AI. Yeah, people <laughs> so kill people, machines don't exactly, kill people yeah. so far. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's zero computers that, you know, on purpose kill people. It's mostly, yeah. But, but I think there's a couple of things. One is that we, gen first of all, people are generally afraid of competition because, you know, so, so, someone, you know, you know so, someone who competes with you can, 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 can make you irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, and... I think historically, people with power quite frequently were malicious, right? So if we're thinking of AGI as a you know extremely powerful entity, it makes sense that we would have some inherent inherent fear of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean Jeffrey Hinton basically says that if um, he's scared of super powerful AI because it can start manipulating people, but it's like if it's just carrying out the actions of its I mean, it will be a person manipulating people yeah. using, using AI. Yeah. AI. I yeah. mean, th that's already happening. It's not, this is not a, yeah. <laughs> like, you can already do that. There's Twitter bots already trying to do this. This has been a thing before, even be before generative AI. So, like, that's not a... Not a new problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, it will get more and more sophisticated and, you know, create, like, you can, you know, imagine it creating more advanced strategies, but... Like somebody gave the, it this mission effectively at this point. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll see, is it likelier to emerge as one very powerful centralized system or more like a kind of emergent swarm of many small agents or many small models? Um, do you have an idea of what, what those systems will look like as they grow? Yeah, it's a bit of a false di dichotomy in the sense that it could be... The, what, what I think it would be is it would be a very large m model, a single model, Good. but that model will be decentralized. I guess we have heard that from you before. So, <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Ilya? I I think 
it, it's the same with um, how we are effectively, you know, a big model, and like individually we are assuming we are conscious uh, <laughs> and uh, you know capable. But the reality is the if you on the metal level there is a society being that is a collective of all of the people. And actually, society being is way more resilient. It have been surviving, you know, for probably you know tens of thousands of years now. It's able to mean, you know, kind of uh, in different ways advance itself and, and upgrade itself and make each cell of itself lo live longer through technology and innovation. And so, like from a evolutionary biology, right? You can think we're cells, and then society is the body. So probably similar thing will happen here again. Given what we're building, there will be large, albeit decentralized models, but they themselves can be interconnected into a network uh, that effectively exchanges information and uh, is able to kind of provide a bigger context. And maybe like some of them are more specialized than others. Uh, maybe not from a even information perspective, but from just access to resources, right? Like a model, like, uh, or from uh, kind of ability to interact with some specific subset of other kind of people and, uh, yeah, so like diff different types of specialization that can occur there. But remind me, do you think the society is conscious? So this is a great example. Yeah, the great question. Uh, it's probably n it. It's a subconscious. Sub <laughs> subconscious. I think I think there there is a sub. I mean, effectively a subconscious. You know, designed to for for society to survive, right? Which propagates into evolutionary need to replicate for ourselves. So yeah, I don't think there's a. Yeah, I mean, given what, you know, especially us killing the planet right now, there's like a very. <laughs> Given how hard it is to coordinate people, there's like a very conscious level, but there's definitely some subconscious organizational things, right, that, you know, uh, lead us to work together in different ways and kind of rely on each other. So, so one interesting way to look at it is, uh, is to try to understand why, why consciousness emerged to begin with, what is the evolutionary advantage. And I think, uh, I didn't put too much thought to it, but I think one advantage of consciousness is that it's, uh, it improves planning. It's much easier to plan when you, when you have consciousness, mm -hmm. right? So society is not particularly good at planning, right? So from this <laughs> perspective, it could be argued that maybe it doesn't have consciousness. But neither, uh, neither are um, models today that good at planning, right? So, so they're relatively good at uh, answering in, in one shot. But if you, I mean, they can do chain of thought, but relatively poorly, mm -hmm. right? So from this perspective, and we know that when, you, when we train a regular large language model, uh, we don't tell her to be intelligent. We just tell her to predict the next token, right? But as it tries to compress all the information given to her, at some point, there's, uh, the, you know, like gradually it realizes that by being intelligent about what it says, it can compress it much better, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to memorize every possible situation. It just needs to understand it conceptually, and then it can compress that understanding. So from this perspective, once we get better and better at planning, like, you know, GPT-4.0.1 is presumably uh, open AI's first step towards that. Uh, that's where consciousness is more likely to emerge. Mm -hmm. right, so that's uh, so. So yeah, once once we start investing in planning, we need to pay more attention. But, but I think so. I agree with that. But uh, I think the consciousness in planning is required because you're part of the plan. Like you individually, as a as a being, is part of the plan. That's why you need to understand how like you will act and react in the future, like. That's the explainability part uh, that you need for planning. If, if you're just like planning for somebody else, right, that it can be like, I mean, you can just use the SMT search, right, and like, create a plan for when, when the searcher itself is not involved in the process. So I think it's, it will require some embodiment, whatever that, I mean, it can be very digital, you know, navigating internet. And this is like, the, <laughs> it's always funny now to reread some of the science fiction because Clearly, you know, physical robotics is not where AI evolution is happening because AI, by, look, by definition, is a digital being. It lives in the digital world. Bringing it back to physical world is actually 
a hard, hard work, and letting it roam in, in, the, in the digital world is where uh, kind of it's the freest. But I think some form of embodiment is required uh, for it to, or like some form of identifier, is, uh, to use the diaspora analogy, yeah, the diaspora, is, the diaspora is, is required to effectively understand that you're present and how your actions will impact yourself. Well, we're already five minutes over. I had many more questions for you, but speaking of planning, I guess we're, <laughs> we're out of time. So we'll solve consciousness another day. Um, thank you, guys. That was fun. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh -huh.